You're talking about airstrikes and retaking cities and intelligence people on the ground. As you know this number, 4,490 lives have been lost in the Iraq war, American lives, $1.7 trillion spent already. How can you advocate any more people, any more lives going to risk for that country? Because it's in our interest, and it's, there are two points about our interest. Number one, as the president pointed out on Friday in his first statement, we cannot allow a, well, the world's worst terrorist group to get a base of support in a failed nation. This is not Afghanistan, which is remote and behind the mountains. This is the heart of the Middle East with a lot of wealth and we cannot allow that to happen. People, a lot of people are watching you right now and they're, they're hearing you give your ideas of what to do and they're saying, but aren't you the guy who got us in this mess? I mean, they're saying, look, you're the guy who ran Iraq for President George W. Bush. And let me just play this, Ambassador, if I can. You in Baghdad the morning after Saddam Hussein was captured. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Yeah. This is a great day in Iraq's history. Iraq's future, your future, has never been more full of hope. The tyrant is a prisoner. Now is the time for all Iraqis, Arabs and Kurds, Sunnis, Shia, Christian and Turkmen, to build a prosperous, democratic Iraq at peace with itself and with its neighbors. We now, of course, know none of that came to pass. How no, did actually, it go so wrong? actually, you're wrong. Aaron, every single bit of that came to pass. They have held, they have the, the, the Arab world's most progressive constitution. They have conducted six elections since I made that speech, all of them democratically. They have a democratically elected government. Their per capita Which income, is just a purging. minute, just okay. a minute. Go ahead. Their per capita income today is six times what it was when I made that speech. They, they had all of that in place. We defeated Al-Qaeda. The Iraqi army defeated Al-Qaeda with our help in 2009. All of those things came true. They have all been reversed in the last two years, three years. Now, so, okay, so now that there's your, your, your argument, but let me ask you this. You have ISIS coming through and offering basic services that aren't being provided by the Iraqi government. Um, I saw the statistics on simple things like electricity when you were still there and in the years after. It was horrible and much worse than it was before. A democratically elected president, of course, who's engaging in purging people who are not of his religious persuasion. How is that success? Aaron, you're, you're, you're going to get your facts straight. First of all, when I left, the electricity production was 50 percent higher than it had been under Saddam Hussein, and it was fairly shared around the country instead of all being pigged by his cronies in Baghdad. Life expectancy has gone up since independence. So the fact of the matter, and it's a, I'm not saying it's a great place to be, it's not, particularly with these terrorists terrorizing in the north. but. It is not as if Iraq cannot be a success. It was a success. It is now being put on the road to failure by these terrorists. What I don't understand is how you can say it, it was a success. After President George W. Bush left office, President Obama was put in a position where he had to do a second surge because Iraq was not stable. We basically had defeated al-Qaeda in Iraq, the Sunni extremists, by the end of 2009, in effect really by the end of 2008. And our departure in 2011, at the end of 2011, was a signal to the Iraqis that we were leaving. We were out, and two things then happened. We lost our ability to work closely with the Iraqis on intelligence and training, and we lost our political influence. Al-Maliki concluded that he was gonna have to be alone, and he's gone off in sort of old Iraqi style to become uh, a, a Shiite uh, dictator. That has to change. That's why the strategy the decision, cannot be done just militarily. The there decision, has to be a though, that you dimension. talk about, the decision that you talk about as, an, as, as a crucial one, which I think everyone could agree on, which is when U.S. Yeah. forces would leave, leave Iraq, that was a decision made, of course, by George W. Bush in the Status of Forces Agreement he signed in 2008. He said all U.S. forces would be out by December 2011. All combat forces. That was a, but that was a decision made by George combat W. Bush. Forces combat forces. That's an important distinction. Yes, it is an important distinction, but when President Obama tried to keep those combat forces in the country, or tried to provide a status of forces agreement, 
the Iraqi government wasn't willing to give diplomatic immunity. Would you have said that he should have kept troops in there without diplomatic immunity? No. In fact, if you read my piece this morning, which you apparently did, I said explicitly that when we do put forces back in there, they should. It, one of the prices for al-Maliki is to sign a status of forces agreement right away. Right, but he, he did not sign one with, with President Obama. So yes, I, I want to make it clear, you're not trying to blame President Obama for anything that's gone wrong, are you? I am saying that his decision to withdraw all the troops at the end of 2011 was a serious mistake. Right, but I'm, I'm the saying that wasn't his decision. That, I'm on the record as saying that in three years ago. Right. It, it, yes, it was, Aaron. But yes, it was it President was. Bush who signed that agreement in 2008 that promised that all those troops would be removed at the end of 2011. The, the planning in 2011 leaked very heavily from the Pentagon and the White House was to keep 20 to 30,000 troops after 2011. Right. The White House then leaked that they really wanted to only keep 3,000. Then they said to al-Maliki, not only do we want a status of forces agreement, but you have to get it through your parliament. So for the first time, to my knowledge, since 1945, we have 84 sto SOFA agreements around the world. We were telling the host government how they should proceed in approving that status of forces agreement. That put al-Maliki in an impossible political situation. But weren't we trying to have him troops. do it in a democratic Excuse way me, and have Excuse his country me, Aaron. agree? Excuse me, Aaron. But hold on, can the you way, answer that question, though? Wasn't he trying will, to use his parliament in a way to have them democratically support after, that agreement? After I answer the question, I'll answer your next question. Usually the system goes, you ask a question, the guest answers it, then you ask your next that question. That is true. I felt like I'd given you plenty of time on the prior question. So as long as you finish it, please answer the one I just asked. From al-Maliki's point of view, we had said we were going to have only 3,000 troops there. That means, in effect, they would do nothing. They would sit at the Bakuba Air Force Base and protect themselves. It's less than a brigade. They would not be able to have any effective counterinsurgency or basically any major training. So we put al-Maliki in an impossible situation with that demand.